Perfect. Okay, so the next presenter is actually a colleague of mine, Karen Jacobson from JTI, based in Geneva. Um, Karen is the Scientific Engagement Director in our Scientific and Regulatory Affairs Department. And today she's actually um, giving the presentation, or we responded to the presentation on behalf of her colleague, uh, Yoko Miyamoto from Japan, who unfortunately could not be, make the GFN today. So if we could start with uh, Miyamoto-san's presentation, please. Thank you for joining me today. I'd like to explain comprehensive literature review on the indoor air quality studies for heated tobacco products. Heated tobacco products, abbreviated as HTP, have become increasingly popular in Japan, and studies on environmental exposure to HTP exhaled aerosol have been increasing accordingly. However, in these studies, the actual exposure amount of surrounding people to environmental HTP aerosol is not clear due to the difficulties in its accurate evaluation. For the purpose of understanding the exposure levels, many studies have been reported on the impact of HTP use on indoor air quality, abbreviated as IAQ, using laboratory settings to simulate various indoor environments. The reported concentrations of indoor air constituents during HTP use varies across the studies as they are measured under a variety of simulated conditions. Therefore, a comprehensive review of IAQ studies was conducted to collect the indoor air concentrations for each constituent of HTP aerosol to evaluate the impacts of these constituents on IAQ and human health from the common standpoint. Literature selection was conducted in PubMed using these keywords. The criteria for the selection were the studies on indoor air concentrations when using HTPs. Studies that only measured particle matter or dust on indoor air and did not report indoor air concentrations in the background were excluded. The evaluation of the health impact of IAQ when using HTPs is to compare the constituents that had statistically significant increase from the background, and to compare them with the exposure limits of each constituent. From 116 records, which include four studies referenced in one review article and one study from our company, as a result, 11 studies were included. A total of 340 measurement results, measuring 46 constituents in various environmental conditions were found in 11 studies for evaluation. Among them, 16 constituents, 62 measurement results showed a statistically significant increase from the background. Among these, one constituent in one measurement result exceeded the exposure limit. We used the exposure limits estimated based on the limits or guidelines provided by environmental authorities or agencies prioritizing as follows. The reported indoor air concentrations were converted into daily intake amounts using this equation to compare with exposure limits. Additionally, we estimated the duration of stay in each condition as follows. This shows the discussion and conclusion of our study. The IAQ measurement conditions varied across the 11 selected studies, including ventilation rate, number of HTP sticks used, and measurement time if among the same simulated environmental conditions. Among a total of 340 measurement results across 46 constituents, 62 measurement results for 16 constituents showed statistically significant increase from the background level, but the increases were only slight. Only one measurement result among 62 measurement results exceeds the exposure limit. The result was NNN concentration in restaurant environment of Enomoto et al. The author mentioned about this result. NNN and NAT were around the LOQ value, making proper evaluation impossible. In fact, the other six measurement results of NNN did not exceed the exposure limit. In light of the indoor air concentrations of almost all constituents remaining below the estimated exposure limit, 
an analysis of available IAQ measurement data suggests that the HTP use in indoor environment is unlikely to affect human health, while further studies are needed to fully elucidate that. Thank you for your attention. Don't know what that noise was. Okay. Um, Karen, any questions for Karen? Remembering that Karen is here representing Miyamoto-san, who is a central one. Over. Uh, you did not, there was, there was no information on uh, the, how the emissions were generated, like uh, not chamber studies rather than atmospheric, right? In the environmental, like uh, users are using the product and, uh, and then you, you sample in the environment. You don't sample the personal area of the, this is what is not clear from the presentation. I understand you review studies, but uh, the studies were following the atmospheric, uh, the, the atmospheric approach, right? Yes, so um, what they did was then they reviewed, my colleagues they reviewed the, what has been published in literature. So you had all of these uh, 11 different studies reporting different uh, results. They were all conducted under different conditions so that's already, that's already something that makes it, of course, difficult to evaluate. As I understand, nine of these studies were done under simulated conditions. So whether it's simulating office or residential conditions, while two, I believe, were done under more realistic conditions. One was done in a car, one in a, in a nightclub. For all of the studies also, you saw a great variation in terms of how many people were were in the simulated conditions, uh, ventilation rate, number of sticks used, uh, and, and, and different times, how, how long they were measuring. But in the end, what they wanted to achieve with this was really to have a evaluating it according to the same conditions. So calculating the, the estimated daily exposure and then comparing this after subtracting background levels, comparing this to exposure limits. The time frame is then daily exposure. So that's how they, that's how they, yes, they estimated the daily exposure based on the measured values, uh, based on res daily respiratory volume and the expected duration that you would say in these conditions. Yeah. And then comparing that to the exposure limits. Yeah, one just final comment. It's about time to compare these aerosols with normal indoor pollution, to compare them with tobacco smoke is, uh, is no longer necessary, uh, just a comment. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Any other questions? Anybody? <laughs> yes. Uh, James Brigger from Pepperdine University. Um, I wondered, have, has your research team considered, um, as part of determining daily exposure, doing a version of that for workers in these venues? So for example, I would imagine one of the issues for indoor air quality laws might be for the workers in a restaurant or the workers in a nightclub who would be there longer. Um, and it seems like the the force of your study would, would be multiplied if you could show even if you worked in such a location, it still wouldn't be of concern. Or maybe you'd find the opposite. But I just wondered if that's something that was considered. So when they, when they compared the estimated daily exposure, they were then using these guidelines that were set by different environment, uh, environmental agencies uh, such as U.S. Uh, Environment Protection Agency. I believe the daily, um, daily estima estimated exposure was more on people residing in those areas, for instance, um, in residential areas for, I think it's 16 hours for, um, in offices, it would be an estimated hour, eight hours per day, et cetera. So I, I'm not entirely sure 
um, yes, how this was compared. Sorry, I couldn't kind of respond. Good question, though. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, please. In, in the study that you conduct, um, do you see an undefined bias uh, about the studies that it's not clearly reported in the studies or in another way? It's uh, after do you this review, how do you conduct and really study to measure uh, the impact of the uh, environment uh, um, how do you see um, toxicity, toxicity of this product? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I fully understood the question. Uh, <laughs> if you could repeat, please. Uh, after the, the, this review, how do you uh, perform a, a, a good study to uh, see the right um, effect of the um, uh, other the, the people surrounded the the smokers yeah so so this study i think really what the aim uh, was really to have a better and more comprehensive understanding of what bystanders um what's the impact of hdp use then on the environmental surroundings and as we saw because the conditions vary so much between the studies, sometimes it's difficult to compare and, and to compare the, re the results. And that's why my colleagues set out to do this, to collect and review all the results and then compare it to the same, the same uh, exposure limits. So of course, this is work in progress. There's, there's more to be done. I think there are more studies coming out. But nevertheless, what they found really was that it does suggest that these constituents that do differ from the background, what you do find in the background, um, for most of them, except for one measurement, they were all below the exposure limits that have been set by different agencies. I don't know if that responds, answer your question. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? So, if, so Karen. So this was a review of the literature, yes, of what's public, what's available out there. I don't think it's a fair question to ask you because you weren't leading. But do you think there's any, let's say, open points? What are the key areas that still need exploring in this these type of indoor air quality studies? Well, I think what we saw in what our, my colleagues saw in the studies, again, because the condition varies very much, the scope varies. While some studies might focus on a few constituents, other focus on more. Um, so from these 11 studies, there were a total of 46 constituents that were being, uh, that were being assessed in these studies. Not all studies were assessed in the same amount. So I think, and again, for some, there were only a few measurements and maybe not in all conditions, uh, but maybe just in residential or office or, or bars or restaurants. And also because the background values, they do differ. So uh, I think, yes, we could expect more studies coming out, um, repeating this in different conditions, uh, under different, uh, different settings, and just basically reaffirming what, what has been published already. Thank you. Well, but again, peace. <laughs> Just a brief comment that in, in this type of studies on environmental aerosols, it is very varying. When you look at the literature, you see so many different types of conditions and environments. And so these studies really require a control state of the same environment without the desire the a stimulant, the desired aerosol. And otherwise, it is uh, uh, terribly difficult to make uh, evaluations of the whole literature. I think you face that also. Uh, absolutely correct. And as, as actually somebody who runs a lab that 
does these type of studies, you're absolutely correct. We use the, what in science we call a positive and negative control. So negative control would be no product use. There's people sitting there um, you know, in a, let's say a smoke-free restaurant or home and then a positive control, for example, with HTB or HTS assessments might be uh, with cigarette smokers in the room. So yes, we look at the different conditions and, and compare. Now it's meet again. Uh, I'm wondering how many of these studies were using actual human uh, smokers who use these products, and how many were the uh, aerosol was generated with some uh, special device smoking machine. So I was looking at this the other day, but to be honest, I do not remember now the exact numbers. So a lot of them, a lot of these studies uh, in simulated conditions were using, um, a, there were HTP users, people that were using HTPs in these uh, simulated conditions. Um, but I, I don't dare to say the number, but there, there were I think one of the early early studies were definitely using machine um, yeah. machine generated aerosols, but there were a significant number that were also using HTP users using them. And again, to support that, I'd, I'd say that yes, there is now a shift towards more, let's say, um, real world simulating uh, studies where you have people using the products as opposed to uh, machine smoking. Got time for uh, one or two more questions, if anyone has questions. No, in which case I think we'll take the opportunity to save a couple of minutes. We might need them later. So thank you very much, Karen. Thank you.